This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to help support the channel, join the Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. Okay, last video of the year. Hi there. This is one of those videos that will likely attract a lot of new viewers. If you're one of them, welcome to the channel. My name is JT, and I make videos about politics and culture from a socialist perspective. I made one of these last year, and I figured it'd be fun to revisit the topic. A lot of structural issues remain unchanged, so if some of this sounds familiar, don't be surprised. So let's get straight to the heart of the matter. Many of the problems in your life are either caused or worsened by capitalism. The good news is, we have the means to solve these problems. When we socialists say a better world is possible, it's because it's true. Capitalism has only really been around for a few hundred years. It's a little bit silly to assume that we just magically found the perfect system and this is how humans are supposed to live. It's not utopian to think that maybe something better can come after. And it's not being bitter or envious to criticize the status quo. Things are bad, we know why, and we know how to fix them. Every system eventually comes to an end. Just as humanity progressed from feudalism to capitalism, so too will capitalism give way to socialism. It's the logical next step in human development. If you strip away all the extra stuff, the core purpose of our species, the only thing that really matters, is leaving a better life for our children. We can no longer do that under capitalism. So let's take a look at some of the problems capitalism creates and why it's time to move on. The example I used in last year's video was the massive transfer of wealth during the COVID pandemic. Now that the dust has mostly settled, we have better data on just how extreme it really was. According to a report by Oxfam, the richest 1% of people accumulated nearly two-thirds of all new wealth generated in the last two years. I'll say that again. Of the $42 trillion of wealth created since 2020, the richest 1% of people, 1%, siphoned off 26 trillion of it. Put another way, for every $1 of wealth earned by someone in the bottom 90%, the upper crust amassed $1.7 million. During the first two years of the pandemic specifically, the 10 richest people on Earth accumulated over $1.5 trillion of wealth, which coincidentally is roughly the amount of wealth lost by everyone else. These 10 people, already so rich they'd make the pharaohs blush, raked in money at a rate of $1.3 billion every single day for two years. Together, these oligarchs hold more wealth than the world's poorest 4 billion people. That is staggering inequality. In a time when 99% of humanity was struggling to make ends meet, when companies were sacrificing their workers on the altar of profit, when millions lost their jobs and had to survive on two tiny emergency checks over the span of two years, the ultra-rich were safe, isolated, and profiting massively off the suffering of their fellow human beings. One staggering statistic that really puts this wealth disparity into perspective is that if these 10 multi-billionaires lost 99.99% of their wealth right now, they'd still be richer than 99% of the population. It's hard to even conceptualize that kind of inequality. But this is what capitalism produces. It's not that capitalism is evil, it's that it is beholden to its own inherent logic. The logic of the profit motive. If the profit motive says a million people need to die to save the economy, then the only possible outcome under a capitalist system is that a million people will die. I said last year that this is not a system that works, but I want to amend that statement. Capitalism does work. It does the thing it's supposed to do, which is accumulate capital. But because of how capitalism works, we're left with a society in which the extreme wealth of the few is a direct result of the suffering of the many. And that tiny handful of multi-billionaires will only get smaller over time. An economic system constructed to produce winners and losers will always end in monopoly. Look at Google, look at Amazon, look at Disney. Every facet of our society is being consolidated under ever-growing megacorporations. And that's not going to stop. It can't. And a system that creates godlike wealth for a handful while actively preventing the vast majority from living a decent life needs to be done away with. More and more people are waking up to this fact as things continue to get worse. But okay, come on. Capitalism is an improvement over feudalism, right? We can't just throw away the best thing we have. You're right, it was an improvement. 
We went from a system where there was no chance of upward mobility to one where some lucky few could rise out of poverty. That's great. But the thing we have to realize is that something which could have been seen as progressive 400 years ago might not be so great today. Things change, and in capitalism's case, not for the better. Again, due to the inherent logic of the profit motive, the ruling class must always take measures to reduce costs and maximize profits. And over time, you start to run out of fat to trim. Today, 50% of all new wealth created goes directly to the top 1% of the population. CEOs of large corporations make over 350 times what their workers do, while employee wages are lower than they were 50 years ago when you account for inflation. But I could almost forgive that if half of all Americans didn't live paycheck to paycheck, or if a $50 trillion transfer of wealth hadn't gone from the bottom 90% of society to the top 1% since 1975. But they do, and it has. And it's not just wages, it's everything else too. 28 million Americans don't get any paid vacation or paid holidays, so they hardly take any time off. And who can blame them? When wages don't even keep up with inflation, and most people can't cover a surprise $400 expense, it's simply not possible to take time off. And that's hardly surprising for a country that also has no federal guaranteed paid parental leave whatsoever. It's not just that we're getting paid less, getting a smaller share of the wealth we produce, and enriching a single percent of the population despite living in the most productive time in human history, we're working more for less. And please don't think I'm cherry picking data here. All of these statistics are from Western, capitalist funded sources. They're all linked in the description if you want to check. Anyway, again, all of these statistics are perfectly in line with the prime directive of our current economic model the accumulation of profit for the capitalist class. They're all justified by the fact that in some way, they've allowed for a small minority of the population, incredibly powerful and wealthy by virtue of ownership of the means of production, to squeeze more out of their workers for themselves. In the last century, we've seen the gradual destruction of unions, a federal tolerance of permanent high unemployment, and a series of changes to the tax system that allow more and more wealth to accumulate at the top. Wealth is more concentrated, we're more overworked, and rampant inequality persists because this economic system has no mechanism to fix these problems. On the contrary, it thrives on their existence. What capitalism demands above all else is profit. And in order for the system to be profitable, somebody needs to get screwed over. And it certainly won't be those with the executive power to set the rules. Think of it like this. No boss out there, however compassionate or kind-hearted they are, will ever pay their employee an equal or greater amount than they bring to the company. It wouldn't make sense. What would be the point of hiring an extra person if all the money they generate goes right back in their pocket? In other words, no matter what your pay is, even if it seems incredibly generous, it's less than what you're actually worth to the company. And the money taken off the top, your surplus value, isn't going to a company fund or R&D or a collective pension scheme, nothing that benefits you or your coworkers even indirectly. No, it's going to the shareholders. Otherwise, there'd be no profit, only expenses and income. This is the fundamental truth of capitalism. The employee-employer relationship is always, always in favor of the employer. Because when it isn't, companies aren't profitable. And that's a big no-no under capitalism and the rest of the economy is there to facilitate that. A consistent natural unemployment and a minimum wage that hasn't budged in 15 years together gives your boss the ability to replace you at any time. It keeps you compliant to their power under threat of poverty. And it gives them leverage to steadily increase the gap between how much money you make for the company and how much you get paid. Okay. I understand that last section may have been a little frustrating if this is the first time you're hearing these talking points. I can hear you saying, well, yeah, it sucks, but how else would a business function? It's just common sense that it has to be this way or the economy wouldn't work. And that right there is the point. It's not that the economy wouldn't work. It's that a capitalist economy wouldn't work. So what about socialism? Whereas capitalists and temporarily embarrassed millionaires believe that free markets inherently lead to the greatest societal good, Socialists have a different perspective. In a nutshell, proponents of capitalism believe that along with a free market, a healthy society is divided into two classes. 
one that owns and controls the productive enterprises and seeks profit, and one that does not own this form of property and therefore needs to sell its labor for a wage. In their opinion, markets, even when they're imperfect, are better at making decisions than democracy is. Socialists disagree. We understand that markets follow the money, not the collective good. And side note, capitalists understand this too. They just think the average person is gullible enough to believe their propaganda. At its core, the whole capitalist system is built on a small group of unelected people having more power than everybody else and using it to enrich themselves. The socialist conception of society does away with all that. But before we talk about what socialists do want, we should briefly touch on what we don't want, because we've all been subjected to a century of Red Scare propaganda at this point, so it's probably worthwhile to clear up some misconceptions. First, we're not trying to make everyone work in the coal mines and wear all gray and have exactly the same number of state-mandated Funko Pops. When socialists use words like equality, we're talking about making sure that everyone is afforded the same baseline standard of living. That's it. We're not trying to enforce uniformity across the board. Everyone has the same basic guarantee when it comes to quality of life. You can go out and improve that, it's not a cap on quality of life. It's just a way of saying you are a human being and that means you deserve a modicum of dignity and security, no strings attached. Individuality, personal expression, the drive to do or become more, none of that will change. That's the best part of being human and socialists are all about it. In fact, pursuing goals, taking up hobbies, creating art, that's all far more possible under socialism where you've got a guaranteed baseline standard of living than it is under capitalism where your options are work or starve. Okay, we've said that a couple times now. Guaranteed standard of living. What specifically does that mean? Universally free, or at the very least universally accessible, housing, education, food, water, and healthcare for all. The right to a life of dignity and basic security because those things are well within our power to provide. There's too much food going to waste, too many empty houses, too much stuff being destroyed to artificially inflate its cost, and too many people making a profit by hoarding our basic needs. Socialists are tired of people being pushed into grueling, dangerous, or demeaning jobs by being threatened with eviction and starvation. Why are we so intent on holding ourselves back by keeping the majority of the species poor and unable to pursue their passions? A society that invests in itself by allowing its people the ability to flourish has a far better chance at longevity and public support than one that withholds necessities for the sake of greater profit. Another thing socialists propose is democratic control over the means of production. We use that word a lot. What does it mean? Think large companies, factories, farms, literally the means by which capital is produced. We advocate for an economy run democratically and not in the search of profit. This can take many forms, whether that's a cybernetically planned economy, a network of autonomous communes, or some other method. What works in the US may be different from what works in other parts of the world. What we can say for certain is that they would all work better than what we have now. Workplaces would be run either without a boss or with one elected by the workers, and the products of this economy would be geared towards satisfying the needs and wants of society without having to be profitable to do so. If you're having a hard time imagining what a democratic workplace would look like, just think about your current job. I'll take retail as a common example. So I used to work at Best Buy as a camera expert. My job on paper was to help customers pick out the camera that would best suit their needs. In reality, management just wanted me to upsell people on more expensive gear. To make a long story short, the camera department is kind of detached from Best Buy proper. We technically reported to the respective brands and we didn't have a brand manager there most of the time. When left to our own devices, the camera department had the lowest rate of product returns in the store by far, because we decided amongst ourselves how best to meet the customer's needs. When corporate started pressing us for higher profits and the GM started forcing us to upsell, the return rate skyrocketed, actual profits shrank, and the department got all kinds of negative reviews. In this scenario, and countless others across the labor landscape, the workers know best how to do their job, and meddling from an unelected manager only makes things worse. Democracy in the workplace increases efficiency and morale and reduces waste. It's a no-brainer. One final thing I'd like to talk about is democracy at the national level, the ability to have a say in how your country is run. In the United States, we supposedly elect people who enact policies that reflect the will of the people. It's pretty clear that this is not actually the case. 
Studies have shown that what the average person wants has next to zero influence on policy, while what lobbying groups want does. Because both major political parties are in the pocket of capitalist industry, particularly fossil fuels and the military-industrial complex, we end up with representation for those with wealth and power. This is something that socialists noticed over a hundred years ago. For example, in his book The State and Revolution, Lenin said, In capitalist society, democracy is always hemmed in by the narrow limits set by capitalist exploitation, and consequently always remains, in effect, a democracy for the minority. Only for the propertied classes. Only for the rich. Freedom in capitalist society always remains about the same as it was in the ancient Greek republics. Freedom for the slave owners. The average American doesn't want to send billions of tax dollars to fund genocides or proxy wars. We don't want to subsidize industries that are making the planet less habitable for our children. We want labor protections, a better work-life balance, a healthcare system that won't bankrupt us. I'm not saying that everything will be perfect in a socialist society. I'm saying these things are impossible in a capitalist one. When we face a problem today, something important like climate change for example, our solutions not only need to be filtered by what will either be most profitable, or at best hurt profits the least, but also the actual solutions we do adopt are made by industries unaccountable to the public. Under capitalism, no government, no scientific board, no body of citizens really has the power to step to the fossil fuel industry. Under socialism, under a democratic economy, a climate change level decision may still be incredibly hard to make, but most people care more about still having a planet to live on than making the line go up every year. And this way, they'll actually have the power to make that decision a reality. That is what socialists offer. A more dignified life and the democratization of power. And the only thing it will cost us is giving up on the outdated idea that there is always a profit-driven solution to our problems. There isn't. And we can do better. Socialism is the way forward for humanity. It is moral. It is just. At this point, it's common sense. We have the data, we just have a lot of work to do deprogramming ourselves from a century of Red Scare propaganda. Anyway, I hope that some of this video has resonated with you and that you'll start asking questions about socialism yourself. If you do, I've got a bunch of other videos to help you learn more. We can do this. We can build a better world. So go on. Why not be a socialist? I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that my content is only possible thanks to my patrons on Patreon. I recently made the decision to leave Nebula, so I'm back to being 100% independent. It's exciting, but also a little nerve-wracking, since Nebula handled all my sponsors. Because a lot of people have been asking, and some bad actors have been trying to start drama, no, I wasn't kicked off the platform. I was asked to make a clarifying statement about my stance on Israel and Palestine, and in the end it felt just a little too both sidesy for me. In my opinion, it's a very black and white issue. So rather than compromise my principles, I decided it was best for me to leave. There's no bad blood there, so please don't go harassing Nebula for my sake. But now that I'm independent again, the best way to support the channel is on Patreon. If you enjoy the work we're doing here at Second Thought, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate your support. Every patron, regardless of pledge amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord. We've got everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, and I try to do a live Q&A every month or so. We've built a great community, and we'd love for you to be a part of it. We're a small team here. We don't have institutional backing, so we're entirely dependent on viewer support. If you'd like to help keep this operation afloat, visit patreon.com slash secondthought and become a patron today. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out our other content by following the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.